Okay, now we're going to look at the phenomenon of elongated skulls, located at different locations around the world and at different times. But the commonality is cranial deformation was a process that was done amongst the elite of different societies, most commonly about 2,000 years ago. My major focus is on the elongated skulls found in Peru and Bolivia, at different locations. But along with David Hatcher Childress, we also studied the basic concept of cranial deformation that was found in different societies. And as well, we're going to look at Akhenaten, the so-called heretic pharaoh, who in his art had depictions, especially of his daughters, as having had elongated skulls. And the question is why? And the most recent work is my work about the Paracas people of the coast of Peru. And what I found out is that, yes, they did perform cranial deformation somewhere between 3,000 and 2,000 years ago. But there is a lot of evidence that the original Paracas people were born with elongated skulls. It's thanks to meeting this man, Senior Juan Navarro of the Paracas History Museum, that I saw my first elongated skulls for the very first time. And this, coming from a medicine biological background, caused my curiosity to be heightened when I actually got to see them in person. It's one thing to see them on television or to see photographs, but to physically be in the presence of them caused me to look through the academic records and the responses and answers I got from academia were quite unsatisfactory. So here we have Senior Juan holding the skull of an 18 to 20 month old Paracas baby. So notice the size of the skull and also notice that it has cinnamon colored hair. We found out that the cinnamon color of hair is genetic and not the result of aging or oxidation or anything like that. So that characteristic by itself makes the ancient Paracas something to be studied and basically I'm the only one doing it. Academics insist that all of this was the result of cranial deformation and nothing else. But you're going to see biological and medical evidence that the phenomenon is far more complex than what most academics state. So here, for example, we see the standard practices of how cranial deformation was done. In this case, it's called cradle headboarding. And this was done very soon after a child was born, again, of the nobility. And it was a way over the course of time to be able to tell the difference between someone of common heritage and someone of noble heritage. So this was done, cradle headboarding, by many different cultures. Here on the left-hand side, up until recently, native people of the Ucuyali region of the Amazon of Peru performed cranial deformation. In the middle is a lady from the west coast of Vancouver Island, British Columbia, Canada, from the late 19th century. And on the right-hand side, uh, people literally called the Flathead Indians. But we also see this phenomena in other parts of the world. So here we have different depictions of how cranial deformation or head binding was done. In this case, by the Inca people of Peru. And once again, another form of cranial deformation or head binding. Uh, binding. But what's curious is that the one on the left is from the Paracas culture. And that shape and size cannot be achieved by head binding. The volume of the skull is larger, and that is not something you can get through manipulation of the skull. You can't increase the volume of the skull. 
So in many different parts of the world, we have the mound builders of the United States, we have the megalithic builders of Europe. Elongated skulls have also been found at Stonehenge, uh, the Andean people of South America, the Maya, the Huns of Eurasia, the Melanesians. But the question is, is there a commonality to all of this? Or was there independent development of this form of altering the shape of a skull to distinguish between nobility and the common people? So the first subject we're going to actually cover in more detail is in Egypt, and more specifically, Akhenaten and the Amarna period, which is the 18th dynasty. So it's thanks to these two men, Abdel Hakim Awian on the left and Stephen Mailer on the right, that I began to study Akhenaten and why he depicted himself in some cases and his children more generally as having elongated heads. So this is a classic original sculpture of Akhenaten. You can see that in some way he's portrayed as having an elongated head. Supposedly, he was not an arrogant pharaoh, though most of them were, and when his sculptors were uh, to depict him in sculpture, he simply said, portray me the way I am. And the great difference between him and someone like Ramses is that Ramses II wanted to be portrayed as the perfect human, but Akhenaten, seemingly not having an ego, just said, portray me as to what I look like. And that makes him very different in the history of ancient Egypt. So here we have two depictions. We have Akhenaten on the left, and we have Nefertiti, his wife, on the right. Notice that both of the busts are damaged because the Amun priesthood, who were in control of ancient Egypt, absolutely hated Akhenaten. And it's quite probable that Akhenaten and Nefertiti and the six daughters were murdered by the Amarna priesthood, or sorry, by the Amun priesthood in order to wipe his existence from history. We do know uh, his genealogy. We do know that his father was Amenhotep III and that Akhenaten was born with the name Amenhotep IV. And that probably means he who worships Amun. But the difference between Akhenaten and his predecessors is that Akhenaten did not like the control of the Amun priesthood, and that's why he changed his name or title to Akhenaten, which means the shade of Aten, which literally means the re-arising of Aten, which is an earlier time period. So here is a full uh, sculpture of him. You notice he's shown with a pot belly and also with almost woman-like torso. Uh, some people think he was androgynous. It is possible that he suffered from some kind of disease which caused him to look less than masculine. And what some doctors state is that he likely suffered from what is called Marfan syndrome, which causes distortion in the development of the skeleton. But we have no specific evidence of that because his mummy was never found. However, he was a disciple of the ancient mystery schools of Egypt, and what he knew was that prior to the time of Amun, which is more or less the dynastic period of Egypt, starting about, say, 2500 BC, up until more or less the time of Cleopatra, that there was an earlier age, and that age was called Aten, and that meant the time of full enlightenment. And so, being immersed in the mystery schools, what Akhenaten tried to do was bring back full consciousness from the time of Aten. And so that's why the symbol of Aten is the sun. Most people will think that the name of the sun in ancient Egypt was Ra, 
but that in fact was only one of five stages of the sun. So here again we have a depiction of the time period of Akhenaten. Notice the damage to the surface of this carving. Again, it was a way for the Amun priesthood to try to eradicate Akhenaten from the historical record. And that's why it's only somewhere in probably the 19th century that artifacts of Akhenaten were found by archaeologists. Before that, most were destroyed or found buried underground. And he was a very radical pharaoh. For example, he moved the capital city of ancient Egypt from Thebes to a remote location called Akhenaten, which means the dawn of Aten, and presently it's known as Amarna. And that's where he built a massive city in the course of not too many years. So he built this massive central city complex, and he left the Amarna, or sorry, the um, Amun priesthood back in Thebes. They lost their jobs because he had moved the administrative center from Thebes to this new location. And present day, this is what Amarna looks like. Basically, nothing was left. The priests of the Amun period, they let him dwell in Amarna for a certain amount of time, but then they decided to take the power back. They wanted full administrative, religious, and financial control of ancient Egypt, and Akhenaten was in their way. So he not only eradicated the royal family, he eradicated the city itself. And it was lost to history until Egyptologists rediscovered this location. These beautiful columns, or what's left of them, are in fact made of fiberglass. So they were reconstructed in order to see what Amarna looked like during the time of Akhenaten. And here, this is uh, Stephen Mailer uh, worshipping the memory of Akhenaten because in between his two hands is where the sun rises on winter solstice. And what that does is that recreates the return of the sun and also the return of the time of Aten. And that is why Akhenaten chose this location. He didn't ch uh, just say randomly, oh, let's build the city here. He knew that there was an ancient center at Amarna, and so he wanted not only to, in a spiritual way, bring back the ancient time of Aten, but he wanted to do it in a location that existed in pre-dynastic times. So, we decided to climb up into the hills at Amarna, and what we found, after unlocking some of the gates, was that there is a complex of tunnels and chambers carved into the bedrock at Amarna, and this is what was found by Akhenaten through the ancient mystery school knowledge. So this, for example, is a chamber cut into the solid limestone bedrock. It's not that limestone is all that hard, but you're talking about two and sometimes three levels in the bedrock and underground. That would be a very difficult achievement during the time of the dynastic Egyptians when they generally had bronze tools. And so what we're seeing is pre-dynastic work done using high technology of times past, rediscovered by Akhenaten and reoccupied. Then we have, again, the depictions. Here, you see that symbolically Akhenaten and Nefertiti are wearing very large cone-shaped hats. Is it that he's intimating that his ancestors, or in fact himself, had elongated heads? And this is uh, more shown by his daughters. Here we have physical depictions of 
elongated heads, not simply flattened heads, but heads with a cranial volume larger than normal. But all we have is the art. We don't have the skulls themselves. And this is another depiction. You can see the shape is swept back like that. It's symbolic, but what does it symbolize? I think what it represents is the fact that Akhenaten is trying to tell us that his lineage and that of his daughters comes from a very different genetic bloodline, possibly directly back to Osiris himself, who is depicted as having an elongated head, the so-called ancient gods of pre-dynastic Egypt. And then curiously, we have a reconstruction of Tutankhamun. Now, Tutankhamun was probably not Akhenaten's son. It was more likely that he was a nephew. But if you look at this reconstruction, his cerebellum in the back is extended or distended, and he has this dip shape in the top of his head. So this could be a genetic characteristic of the royal bloodline of Akhenaten and his family. Then this is what's left of his sarcophagus, made of granite and almost completely destroyed. So, so much was the hatred of the ancient priests of um, Egypt to Akhenaten. They destroyed every artifact they could find that has his, had his cartouche or depiction on it. And then we move to Peru. And in Peru, we find many different shapes of elongated heads, not simply the shape like that of Akhenaten, but this photograph shows you the back room of one of the uh, museums, and here you can see different shapes of elongated skulls. And what's very curious <clears throat> is that basically all of them are found along this line, which says the Kapaknyan, which means the royal road. And it's along this line we find almost all of the ancient megalithic structures in Peru. So there's a direct relationship between megalithic structures and elongated skulls. So from this shape and this Kapaknyan line of megaliths and elongated skulls, we go to this more complex description or design. And if we take what's called the Andean cross and superimpose it on the landscape of this part of Peru, we see that all the megalithic structures are along this one line, but then other oddities and anomalies are also located on different angled lines. And one of them points to the coastal area of Paracas. Now, many different cultures in ancient Peru had elongated skulls. The oldest ones are found in the Chinchorro culture that was located in northern Chile. And here we have a depiction, and actually an actual photograph, of an elongated skull of the Chinchorro. This could be as much as six to eight thousand years old. These people were mummifying their dead before the time of the dynastic Egyptians. And then the skulls get even stranger. This is another Chinchorro skull. Notice the protrusion on the forehead, the rounded nature of the back of the skull. So this could actually be a naturally elongated skull. The cranial volume appears to be at least slightly nar uh, larger than normal. And then as we proceed up this Kapaknyan, which is also called the Path of Viracocha, we reach this ancient volcano. And located behind the volcano are tombs of people with elongated skulls. Not profoundly elongated, but cranially deformed. And here again, another depiction. The volume of the skull is not larger than normal, but you can see the flattening of the back of the skull and the forehead showing cranial deformation. Then the farther we go, we come to Cerro Potosi, which was an incredible silver mine. The entire mountain 
was made of silver, more or less. And here again, in the ancient tombs, we find elongated skulls. Now what's curious here is the one on the right is cranial deformation. You see the flattening of the back of the skull and the flattening of the forehead, but the one on the left-hand side was about a two-year-old baby. And you can see that the volume of the skull is quite a bit larger, at least 50% larger, than a normal human head. And then the farther to the northwest we go, we come to the one Karani culture. They existed around 2000 BC. And again, you can see the size of the skull is larger than normal and very complex in design. Next, still following this path, this Kapaknyan, we get to what's called Tiwanaku. And Tiwanaku is an enig enigmatic site close to Lake Titicaca. And there again, we find elongated skulls. So once again, the correlation between megalithic sites, this path, and also elongated skulls. This one as well was larger than normal and likely so, uh, somewhere in the region of 2,000 to 3,000 years old. Further along, we get to Lake Titicaca and the Island of the Sun. This is what's left of a megalithic site. And here as well, we find elongated skulls. Once again, most likely cranial deformation. But in this same area, this two-year-old skull was found with a cranial volume larger than normal. And so this could be our first candidate of an ancient person born with an elongated skull. Then another megalithic site called Silustani, located at Lake Titicaca. This tower is said to have been made by the Inca civilization, but in fact, the Inca did not have the technology constru to construct this, so they simply inherited it and adapted it for their own use. And here we find cranial deformation. Nothing too strange, but distinguishing between the nobility and the common people. And as well, at Arequipa in Peru, uh, elongated skulls have been found. And next, now it gets incredibly curious, because we're still along this energetic path, and here, close to Cusco, are the remains of this mummified so-called baby that theoretically died at two years old, 800 years ago, its skull is the size of its torso. So there's no way that this is cranial deformation. This is genetics. Again, the skull, the size of the torso. And this depicts that, as you can see. You can also see the neck is longer than normal. And this uh, baby, called Waiki, has one set of ribs fewer than what we have. Now, when we look at the top of the skull, this is called the fontanelle. And the fontanelle normally closes by two years of age. But this is where other genetic anomalies come into play with the Waiki skeleton. Look at the skull, look at the face. The eye sockets are larger than normal, and they're vertically longer. So that is not the depiction of a normal human baby. As well, it has permanent molars. So a so-called two-year-old baby has the molars of a 10 or 12-year-old. So what I'm starting to insinuate is this is not Homo sapiens sapiens. In the same cemetery, which was a royal cemetery near Cusco, this 15-year-old was found. And this is a reconstruction on top of an actual human skull. She was of nobility. And again, look at the shape and complexity of the skull. Now we're in the city of Cusco. 
And these are supposedly from the Inca time period, the, but the, they have not been radiocarbon or carbon-14 tested, so we don't know what age they are. But the cranial volume is at least slightly larger than normal, and we're going to start to see that some of the sutures present in the skull are missing. So here, for example, a one- or two-year-old baby, theoretically from the Inca time period, the head is larger than normal in terms of cranial volume. It, too, was found in a royal cemetery, so this was a baby of nobility. Then when we get to the vast archaeological complex of Ollante Tambo in the Sacred Valley of Peru, nearby a royal cemetery, and here you can easily tell the difference between a very large elongated skull on the right with the forehead protuberance and then some normal looking skulls on the left, but the one on the left closest to the right in that group is quite a bit larger than the others. And as we visit more and more obscure little museums in the highlands of Peru, again, anomalous skulls show up. Oops, sorry. So here, for example, we have maybe a one-year-old baby. However, the fontanelle on top of the skull is closed. The suture, which is supposed to be going back this way, is missing, and it has this protuberance on its forehead. So again, another skull which is anomalous. And at the ancient site of Wadi, which is megalithic in the highlands of Peru, these large basalt slabs were not created by the Wari culture, they were found by the Wari culture and incorporated into their construction. And from this location, other anomalous skulls have been found, especially the one in the middle. You also notice that brain surgery has been done, and that we find commonly as well in association with the elongated skulls. It's a very complex subject, but we'll get into that. And at another nearby museum, more examples of elongated skulls. Whether they're from the Wadi civilization, which is the one that preceded the Inca or not, again, no carbon-14 testing, so we can't tell yet. But now we start to move into the focus culture, and that's the ancient Paracas that existed between 3,000 and 2,000 years ago. In a very obscure little museum, these three mummies were on display, but are now back in storage. And the reason for that will be quite obvious. Look at this mummified baby, supposedly five years old at the time of death. The head is the size of the torso. So this is not an example of cranial deformation, this is genetics. And this is just to focus on the shape of the head. It, the back, you can see, is rounded, and it's very complex in terms of curvature. So again, I'm stating that this individual was born with an elongated head and genetically was not Homo sapiens sapiens. Then, as we get to the coast of Peru itself, the skull on the left is the most famous elongated skull in the world, and it is from the Paracas culture. Some people have labeled it as being Nephilim, others as Anunnaki, even others as alien-human hybrid, and even others as being alien. But you can't tell that unless you actually do DNA testing, which fortunately we were able to do. So in the Little Paracas Museum in Paracas, Peru, we have a collection of 45 different elongated skulls of the nobility of the ancient Paracas people. Now, Paracas is located three and a half hours drive south of the capital city of Lima, and it is the largest natural bay on the coast of Peru. And this 
is evidence possibly that these people did not originate on the coast of Peru, but actually migrated there from somewhere else. And these are some of the clues. For example, Totora reed, which grows in Lake Titicaca, also grows on the coast of Peru. It's indigenous. And with that reed, you can build not simply a canoe, but you could build an ocean-going ship as much as 150 feet long if you wanted to. It just means that you use more and more reed to build a larger and larger craft. Also, cotton is indigenous to the coast of Peru, so sails could have been made out of cotton. And then you had a major sea-going craft. Because what we find in the archaeological record are spondula shells. And spondula shells are only found off the coast of Ecuador to the north of Peru. So it's highly unlikely that the spondulus uh, was traded through people walking paths, but far more likely that the Paracas themselves sailed north to Ecuador using these Totora craft because the prevailing winds 80% of the time are from the south to the north and then 20% of the time from the north back to the south again. And another clue into this is there is a 500 foot tall geoglyph called the Candelabro uh, located at Paracas Bay. And it looks like it's a navigational marker. It can only be seen from the sky or from the sea. And behind it rises the Southern Cross, which is a major instrument of ancient navigators. And it is the beginning of what is called the Nazca geoglyph and line system. The geoglyphs and lines are not simply located in Nazca, but extend from Paracas 160 miles south to Nazca. And now we're going to get into the actual skulls of Paracas themselves and their physical abnormalities. So this is an example of one of the nobility of the Paracas and the shape is very complicated and it is completely mummified, including having genetically red hair. So if you have genetically red hair, it's quite likely that you also have lighter colored skin than normal Native Americans and you could also have had green or blue eyes. These are not the characteristics of indigenous people of Peru from 2,000 to 3,000 years ago. Because theoretically, outside genetics, as in European contribution to the genetic landscape, didn't happen until the arrival of the Spanish in about 1532 AD. And then we have a different design of skull. You see the back of this one is rounded. And so this was another class of nobility. It's quite possible that you had genetic variation in the ancient population here. And contrast those two with this shape. This is at near the end of the time of the Paracas people. You see the flattening of the forehead and the flattening of the back of the skull. So this is where normal people, no, normal Homo sapiens sapiens, started to influence the design of the latter part of the Paracas period. And now the most dramatic example. Contrast this shape with that. So here we have cranial deformation and here I believe this is a natural elongated head of the ancient Paracas people of Peru. Now we can contrast this design on the right with that of the left. That of the left is normal Homo sapiens sapiens. That on the right is vastly different. And then we start to look in finer detail. Here, 
the suture structure of Homo sapiens sapiens. You have these two suture lines, the coronal coming across, and then the parietal coming backwards this way. Every Homo sapiens sapiens that we know of has that suture structure. But when we look at the elongated skulls of Paracas, the sagittal suture running this way is simply missing. And medical professionals can't explain why that is. Then as well, on the front of the skull, we have what are called foramen. So in our lower jaw or mandible, we have mental foramen. And then there are others located on our face. That is where blood and nerve flow come out in order to feed nutrients, blood, oxygen, etc., to the front of the face because it's quite far away from the actual circulatory system in your neck. But what's curious about the Paracas ones is they have these foramen in the back of the skull. We don't have that. And so what that's telling us is that there is a relationship between the elongated skull and the path of nerve and blood flow. So that again is a genetic characteristic. Then also this extension down here is for the attachment of muscles. So this is what it looks like in a normal human skull. And in the Paracas it's quite a bit larger. So that would mean muscle attachment because of the shape and design of the elongated skull was more complicated in the ancient Paracas people. Then we look at what's called the foramen magnum. And that is where your spinal column and circulatory system enters the bottom of your skull. As you can see, it's right in the center of balance in your skull. But with the Paracas, it's two and a half centimeters or one inch back. So that is a genetic characteristic. And here we'll do a comparison between a normal skull on the right and two of the Paracas on the left. You'll also notice that the actual foramen magnum is much smaller, much narrower in the Paracas. And this indicates that their necks were longer than normal. And this is just another example of that. Also, blood testing has been done of 14 ancient Paracas. And in the literature, what it states is all native people who were and are full-blooded in Peru had or have solely 100% blood type O. But when studies were done in the 1970s of uh, 14 different individuals based on blood taken from cloth from ancient tombs, 28.6% of the individuals were blood type A, 6.1% blood type B, 12.2% blood type AB, and only 53% blood type O. So that means a complex mixing of genetics on the coast of Peru long before the presence, supposedly, of any Europeans or any outsiders. We've also recently figured out that the end of the Paracas was caused by genocide. Some people moved in from the north and they obliterated or tried to obliterate the royal bloodline of the Paracas people and take over their land. So this, what you're seeing, is a killing field. All of these skulls were elongated, all the result of cranial deformation, so at the latter end of the Paracas period, and all having evidence of blows to the head, and the bones are simply scattered. The royal people of the Paracas would have been buried in a very careful manner. These were simply dumped in a pile and buried in a shallow nature. We also know that the famous astronaut of the Nazca system was created by the Paracas people long before the presence of the Nazca people. And as well, in between Paracas and Nazca, there's an area called Palpa. 
And there we find more than a thousand geoglyphs created by the Paracas people. So most people know about the Nazca figures such as the hummingbird and the spider. They were created by the Nazca to the southeast in Nazca proper, but in between we have these smaller but numerous geoglyphs, very complex in design of the ancient Paracas people. As well, hidden in the deserts of the Nazca area, the largest ceremonial city in the world created by the Paracas people. It was called Kahuachi, and it was inherited or taken over by the Nazca after the demise of the Paracas. And unfortunately for the Nazca people, they were not very good at agriculture, and that combined with climate change in the area caused them to have to abandon the Nazca area around 600 AD. And we know also that what they did in desperation is that they unearthed the older Paracas noble skulls and used them for divination. They cried back to them asking for them to bring rain in a desperate attempt to survive. So we have other artifacts such as this made by the Paracas depicting elongated heads. And here we have a classic Paracas elongated skull with the genetic red hair. Hair experts who have studied the hair of the Paracas say it is much more Caucasian in character than it is Native American and that the color is genetically dark red. Also contrast the baby Paracas, which was 18 to 20 months old on the right, with a one-year-old normal Homo sapiens sapiens on the left of about one-year-old. Look at the different shape and the different size of the skulls, the difference in the eye sockets, etc. And even their god, was, who was called Khan, is depicted as having red hair. And in the ancient cemeteries, many different examples of the genetic red hair can be found to this day, and in some cases, blonde hair. Once again, through time, through oxidation, etc., black hair cannot become red or blonde. So this is another genetic distinction. And now what's important is to get into the actual DNA analysis. So in terms of standard migration, supposedly all of the ancient Peruvians from pre-Columbian times, their ancestry comes from haplogroup B. And the source of that is Southeast Asia. And that is consistent with migrating across the Bering Land Bridge 12,000 plus years ago and eventually migrating to the coast of Peru. However, when we did our DNA tests, the results became quite intriguing. Here we have, once again, the 18-month-old baby Paracas skull. Its maternal or mitochondrial haplogroup turned out to be U2 E1, source of which is the Black Sea and the Caspian. And then the skull on the right-hand side, its haplogroup turns out to be T2, which again goes back to Europe or Eurasia. And then this one, its mitochondrial haplogroup is H1. It's found through Europe, but the source area is the Black Sea and Crimea. So it's highly unlikely of migration of people across land to Siberia, across the Bering Land Bridge, and all the way down the Americas to the coast of Peru. It's more likely maritime emigration 3000 BC or earlier. So again, another DNA test, the one on the left-hand side, H2A. Source, the Black Sea and Crimea. And then a more extensive series of testing. 
Again, the blood or the haplogroup we're expected to find in terms of mitochondrial is B. But instead, what we got from 17 different skulls, U2E1, U2E, H1, H, J1B1. Uh, then some examples did show up. Four examples of haplogroup B, as in B4, B4, then H and R, and H and B5. So the majority show ancestry not from the coast of Peru, not from migration through the Bering Land Bridge, but probable migration from the Black Sea and Caspian Sea areas, because that's where the other largest elongated skulls in the world have been found. The two locations in the world, the Black Sea and Caspian, Crimea area, and the coast of Peru. And the haplogroups uh, confirm that. So here are some elongated skulls found in the Crimea, Black Sea area. And there you can see, in the case of the one on the right, there is an extra suture line coming down the forehead. That is consistent with what we also find in different locations in Peru. That is not normal in Homo sapiens sapiens. And very recently, a baby was found about two years old in Crimea, shown here, with the skull the size of the torso. And so I've checked out the possible migration patterns, and it is quite possible that one can sail from the Black Sea into the Mediterranean, and then into the Red Sea, and then you're caught by a current that takes you across the Pacific via the equatorial countercurrent. From there, you reach the coast of Ecuador, and if you wait for the wind to change, your vessel will be blown straight down to the largest bay on the coast of Peru at Paracas, which would not have had many people living at it at the time. So if these people were possibly refugees, escaping invaders, then the coast of Peru would have been a great place to reestablish themselves. Now this is an, uh, is an example of a drawing done in the 19th century from a baby, actually a fetus, found in Paracas. Notice the head is the size of the torso. The neck is longer than normal. It appears to have teeth at seven to nine months old in utero. So that obviously is a genetic anomaly, not Homo sapiens sapiens. And then this is a full skeleton found in the Lake Titicaca area. And you can see that the skull is much larger than normal. We're going to go back to study more in terms of abnormalities in the skeletal structure. Um, but this was a female. I was fortunately uh, with a radiologist from the United States when we found this little museum. And when he looked at this, his immediate reaction was, that is not human. And so it gets more curious because he said that was probably a 12-year-old female of childbearing years. And in the same tomb was found this fetus of seven to nine months old. And again, you see the skull is the size of the torso. And he believes, 90% certainty, that this was mother and baby, and that they both died during childbirth. And another newborn baby from Paracas, the skull has a cranial volume <clears throat> at least 50%, if not 100%, larger than normal. Curiously, this is a banker who lives in Spain. And he has a elongated skull. So whether there are people living to this day like that or not, I'm not sure. But other anomalies have been found on the coast of Peru. This is the so-called Maria mummy. 
that some regard as being alien or an alien-human hybrid, but it's been shown that it's actually a fabrication. The body was likely from the Nazca time period of 1,800 years ago, and then the skull or head from the Paracas period, so the hull, uh, skull was likely attached to the body to make this fabricated uh, specimen. Also a three-fingered hand which was x-rayed and shown to be a fabrication. This is the underside of that. And this is a x-ray. According to two radiologists that looked at this x-ray, the bone structure is not normal. Some of the bones are backwards and others appear to be from other individuals. So unfortunately, this appears to be a fabrication. And then we have reconstruction efforts done by Marcia K. Moore, who's an American artist. She, for the first time in 2,000 years, has tried to reconstruct what the Paracas faces looked like. So, for example, she was able to take this skull from a 10- to 12-year-old Paracas. She had a resin cast made, and then she rebuilt the muscle and skin structure based on the shape of the skull. She has no prejudice one way or the other as regards what this person looked like. She simply rebuilt through interpretation. So here she is clay modeling. And here, you can see on the left hand side, is the resin copy that she started with, and then the different phases of rebuilding it. Prior to that time, she did reconstruction based on a computer program. And this is her first analysis according to the uh, computer program that she was utilizing. And finally, this is her latest interpretation. So what you can see from the evidence is that the idea that the Paracas people of the coast of Peru simply genetically evolved on the coast of Peru is highly suspicious. Uh, no academics that I know of want to study this subject. We have seen proof that in terms of their blood types, they were genetically and ethnically very complicated. Their skin tone may have been much lighter than normal native people of Peru. They may have had green eye color or blue eye color. They had genetically red hair. They may have very well migrated from almost halfway around the world. And that is the present state of the study. But the DNA testing continues, and I will get to the bottom of who these ancient people were. And I thank you for watching this presentation.